Hi guys, um, my name is Benjamin White, New Yorker, entrepreneur, and one of the co-founders of 21212. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled uh, uh, to be here today, glad to see um, uh, everybody, uh, all the great support for entrepreneurship here in Brazil. And um, you know, Rio de Janeiro is my other home, other than New York, and uh, thrilled to be able to introduce a, a really good friend, longtime friend, and, and colleague, one-time colleague, um, to uh, have a talk today uh, with you guys about entrepreneurship. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit of Mark's background, so as he will do it justice. Uh, Mark's a serial entrepreneur. He's a co-founder and chief creative officer of Mark Echo Enterprises. Um, it's a billion dollar global fashion and lifestyle brand. Uh, most people will recognize Echo by the trademark Rhinoceros logo uh, that you'll find on clothing all over the globe. Brazilians are particularly familiar with Echo as Brazil is uh, the number two market for Echo worldwide. His journeys as an entrepreneur started with t-shirts when he was 20 years old, college student uh, in the early 90s and evolved into what now is a company of over $1.5 billion in revenue. Um, he's moved from clothing brand to all forms of media, from print magazines to a social gaming company. And now Mark is also the founder of Artists and Instigators, a venture innovation company and a partner, and he's also a partner at 76 Capital, which is a top performing early stage VC fund. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome my good friend Mark Eckler to the stage. What's up? All right. Uh, ooh, this guy's live. He's live. I feel um, like Janet Jackson. This mic. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, we can definitely do. Should we do the dance routine? I'm down for it. It feels like conference fatigue is set in a little bit, so maybe they need. They might need me to get naked. <laughs> Um, so when I asked Mark to participate uh, in this panel, we were discussing ideas for a title and a topic. Um, and he asked me, you know, what's the word, word for hustle in Portuguese? Um, and took, I paused for a second and I said, I think the probably the closest thing is jeitinho. Um, so the Brazilians get it. Um, and so that's the sort of framework and the format for today's conversation, uh, which is called Hacking Entrepreneurship, Jitinho for Startups. Yeah. Um, so, I'm gonna adjust here. Yes, it's supposed to be like a fireside. Yeah, I don't think they, these folks know what a fireside, we need like a fireplace. <laughs> They've seen the movies. Fire. <laughs> they know what a fire yeah. looks like. Um, so, you're a bit of an etymologist. Right. Um, which in layman's terms means you love words. That's right. Uh, and so, and I think words have always been like a critical part of, of kind of your vocabulary. And like when we talk about words, not just the, the textbook definition, but also um, sort of the social, the emotional and like cultural overlay right. um, for words. Yeah. And I think this is an interesting thing too, because um, when we worked together uh, years back, you always were using the word hustle. Right. Um, and I thought that was a great, uh, you know, it's something that stuck with me. Yeah. Um, and, and when we talked about the, the, the topic for today, the idea of Jachinho, and I think hacking to some degree, and hustle are these, are a different set of words than um, entrepreneur, than entrepreneur right. or lean startup methodology, right. et cetera, et cetera. So I'd love you to talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, the, um, First of all, like, you know, kudos to GEC and the folks at Kaufman and Endeavor for organizing this uh, event and they successfully been able to do this year after year and kind of create this energy where people get together all over the world. I think, um, and, and with the growth, and there's a lot to be applauded and, and recognized. I actually heard in the last uh, panel uh, um, the, someone mentioned that you know entrepreneurship has become like fashionable and somehow that's dangerous. And I would actually challenge that it's not fashionable. As much as we're all here, there we really could use a lot more people thinking about entrepreneurship. And um, 
the problem with entrepreneurship is, as a word, is besides, I don't know if there's anyone French in the room, you can hold your ears. Um, but it's a French word, number one. No, I'm kidding. Um, uh, uh, it needs to undertake. I think there's, it's kind of a culturally heavy word. It's not as mainstream and as colloquial as like Chichino or Hustle, which, and I think the point is, is that within culture and amongst, you know, a broader audience, the kind of intuitive, common sense things that we understand about entrepreneurship that brought us to the table, the kind of extreme sport of business, it's kind of really intuitively understood. Mm -hmm. And we have a tendency to over-intellectualize it with good intentions um, and uh, uh, sometimes create ivory towers uh, where we don't necessarily invite a broader group to the party. And for me, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'd like to see entrepreneurship be as fashionable as, you know, Nike or something. You know, I think that would be good for the world. I think more people parroting, you know, badass entrepreneurs rather than just, you know, great footballers or great basketball players would be good for culture. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we move from a culture of, you know, I'm a consumer, I want X, to I am a producer, I made Y. That's the, that's the spirit of what we're, I think we're all trying to collectively work on. Uh, and, um, you know, that's where, you know, I celebrate words like Tuccino or Hustle or wherever it is in your country, that kind of colloquial thing that, you know, the guy breaking his back, you know, pulling the cart can kind of relate to. Yeah. That's ultimately what it's going to look like. I don't care if you're creating some algorithm or if you're schlepping that cart. It's going to be hard work, and it's yeah. going to be yeah, uh, an extreme sport. Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, as a side note, too, I was talking to Linda, the CEO of, of Endeavor, yesterday, and and she told me something I didn't know, um, which I hope is true because I'm now about to say it in front of a oh, boy. Boy. Um, is that the word emprendedor, which is right. entrepreneur, right, in Portuguese, didn't exist until the early 2000s. Wow. So, and in fact, she served as a reference. Uh, to the dictionary, to the, to the uh, you know, whoever right. adding new words to the dictionary, validating what the definition of emprendedor means. Right. Um, whereas the word chichino has existed for generations right. here, right? So that maybe also kind of illustrates the, the high-low, um, but the conceptual kind right. of through line, right? right? So maybe give a quick example of, you know, what, the kind of what is hustle to you and what has it meant in terms of your personal story? Well, I, I you know, for me, I, um, I view myself more as, a, as an artist, and actually when you study the word artist, it, it's kind of like the practice of a craft. And, uh, you know, I, I came up painting uh, t-shirts in my, my garage at, you know, 18 years old, um, and, uh, you know, um, I found a narrative, you know, I found a narrative and kind of cultural connection coming up in the 80s in Northeast, uh, uh, you know, America, and New Jersey specifically during the emergence of hip-hop culture. And there's something kind of really compelling about counterculture movements giving birth to really important entrepreneurial events, right? It's almost like we, there's like a built-in nemesis of everybody being dismissive about this new movement, which uh, people thought was just this trend in music, but we, as the stakeholders, creating businesses around it thought was an enterprise, something more meaningful. Right. Um, and uh, it, you know, so for me, that that's what I, that, that's part of my my journey, and you know, having you know, just coming up, uh, you know, dropping out of college, and you know, went to Rutgers College of Pharmacy, uh, which makes all the sense in the world as a kid that was into graffiti, obviously going to pharmacy school. Um, uh, makes all the sense, right? Uh, but I end up leaving in 1993 uh, to formally start my business. And the first decade was kind of just a, a lot of um, failing and failing fast and, you know, kind of my real, where my real education came from. Uh, but at the end of that first decade, we actually built uh, the, the, a strong basis and foundation for what has become, you know, the whole uh, apparel enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah, so you mentioned, I mean, we've, this, this idea of, of sort of counterculture and, and these people who start on the fringes, 
um, eventually making their way into the mainstream to have kind of a massive, massive impact. Uh, and I think, you know, I wanted to talk quickly about like what can we learn from that. We've got Jay Z as one example um, that Jobs. that came out of the uh, yeah that came yeah. out of uh, uh, hip hop, and then Steve Jobs who was you know, a hippie. Like, yeah, I mean he was a hippie tripping on some real shit. Okay? <laughs> I mean like major acid. <laughs> right, there's nothing subtle about it. Okay, um, I think that. We need to uh, acknowledge that sometimes entrepreneurship and the roots of it um, uh, come from places uh, or can be compelled or provoked uh, um, uh, because people find a purpose to overcome the cynicism of, a, let's say, a nemesis, right? Or, or someone that says it can't be, therefore it shouldn't, right? So in the instance of like a Jay-Z or even the instance of a of kind of a, a of, a, of, of a, a Steve Jobs or whomever in the room that's working on something. I think all of us have a little bit of that revenge fantasy going on that kind of compels or provokes us, right? Um, I think that's healthy and that's good. And, 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 and I think acknowledging that and, and even prescribing to young entrepreneurs, like what is your revenge fantasy? Like what is it other than mode money that's motivating you? Yeah, actually, yeah. That, I think when we talked the other day, you sort of talked about those three types of people, right. which would be interesting for the right. audience, right? It's, the, like the, yeah, it's, it's like there's the three different types. There's the, the folks that I forget it now. <laughs> I was riffing that. Want to make but, money? Yeah, there's the one that, there's the, the folks that, you know, want to make money, that are motivated by money. Yeah. There's the folks that are, you know, hey, team spirit, you know, right here, give it here, right? They want to win, right? And then there's the folks that want to be right, right? And... You know, the, the guy that wants to be right is um, sometimes a little scary, you know, uh, you know, like that guy. But I don't think it was money or just winning, you know? And, I, and obviously striking the right balance between these motivations. But there's something that uh, where in the most obscure of places in this kind of hippie, free-thinking, transcendental meditation movement that was kind of taking over music culture and just the university culture, he found the pearls that provided the, the, the narrative to his path. Right. In Jay-Z's case, you know, it was, look, it was, he viewed himself as being a businessman, not a businessman, but a businessman. And yeah, it started with trafficking in illegal substances, okay? So, you know, the, the, the point is, is that the, there are more people that we need to be galvanizing and inviting into this conversation. Mm -hmm. yep. And you know what, maybe contrary to some white paper that's written, you know, with good intentions, um, it might not be the next hundred million dollar business and therefore maybe not important in the same way that a hundred million dollar important is businesses to the GDP. But to the guy that owns a 10 or 20 million dollar business, it's pretty important, right? Yeah. Okay. And how do we get more people feeling like they could actually do that, right? And uh, getting younger folks, more diverse thinking, and more paradigms other than just the technology sector, because everything's technology. Like everything is tech enabled today, right? It's getting more and more demystified, and pipes are breaking up, and more and more SaaS solutions you can plug in. So. You know, even though I want to maybe launch a new fashion business tomorrow, there's no way I'm contemplating not deploying all the efficiencies of, of technology. Yeah. You either broadcast it or publish information about it or, you know, to manage my inventory or whatever it's going to be. So does that make me a technology company? Does it make me a fashion? You know, yeah. kind of the lines become blurred. Got it. So um, you have a new book coming out next fall uh, that talks about importance of building your own personal brand yes um, and I'd love you to I'd love just to let you loose on that topic for a minute because right. I know it's something you feel <laughs> a passionate, yeah, passionate really about, about enough about. to sit down and write a book which is probably <laughs> yeah, two years two two and a half years of, uh, of kind of uh, deep thinking kind of at really 40 years of living the book is called Unlabel and um, the the book is about challenging people to think of themselves, to view themselves as artists. 
and to kind of put down the labels, like we talked about this conversation started with the, the label of entrepreneur. Why is it if I were to ask you in kindergarten, if you guys are all kindergartners, I'd say raise your hand if you're an artist. You all raise your hand. And I asked you that today. Like how many people are in here are an artist? By the show of hands. Right? Like that, that's a problem. Like it, it, that's a problem. Because we somehow culturally assign the notion of artist to being able to take crayons and make pretty pictures on, on the surface, right? It is, a, it is a creative, philosophical approach to problem solving, right? So it's challenging people to say, you know what? You, you are a creator. This is what it means to be a creator, right? And this is what it means to view yourself as a brand. Well, first of all, creator, brand, whoa, that's like a holy war. How do you reconcile those things? Creation is the work of the divine, right? Right? So branding, that's the dirty work, that's the crass shit that the ad man does. Right? No, 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 no. Today, you have to view yourself with the audacity of productizing yourself. I know this sounds transactional or vulgar, but as a brand, right, we're so fragmented, chances are most folks are going to have six, eight, ten jobs in their career, right? You've got to view yourself that way, but you have to also be careful. What are the trappings of that? So the book tells you as a guy who's built a brand. Right? who got caught in the hubris of his own kind of, his, his perceived brand. Right? I talk about it in the book. There's two types of brands. There's the brands that's from the world to your skin, right? And then there's the brand that's under your skin to your guts. Guts to your skin, your inside brand. How do you reconcile those two things? How do you not get caught up in the pride of building the perceived one? Or kind of getting high on your own supply of your hubris and your pride and your success? And the trappings of that. And having done it, and, and you know, <coughs> fell down many times, and have some real meaningful war wounds, the book is intended to kind of share those devices and um, talk about the anatomy of a brand. Yeah. And like any good business book, right. you manage to boil it down to a simple sound bite. Very simple. So we could take a look at that maybe. Yes, it's very simple. There's a formula. <laughs> The anatomy of the brand is built on the spine that is authenticity. And the book basically uses, and I take the piss, I'm taking the piss, guys, okay? It's a joke, right? <laughs> but the idea is, because uh, we live our lives trying to comply to a finite number, a finite event. I graduate college, there's the box, you know, and on it say some, usually some calligraphy and your name, and there's the degree. I have complied, I am now, I'm now intelligent, I have the degree. I've complied. I look how many followers I have on Twitter or Facebook. Look how much money I've had. I mean, like our whole life is measured building, trying to live to a number or some finite event. And I'm saying bullshit on that. And to be genuinely authentic, you need to reconcile the fact that authenticity will be a work in progress. It will be a bunch of events, data points along a path. It's much more longitudinal calculus. So the book. This is kind of meant to be kind of a joke, but it acts as the spine of uh, the lessons or the tools in the book. Talk about unique voice, being truthful, you know, the imagine factor, the, you know, the role of reconciling, you know, it's not what you make, it's how you make people feel, the emotional impact factor that informs your authenticity. And viewing yourself and saying, you know, am I aware? Like, and do I, am I worried about how I'm making people feel? Right. You know, like in my business, in this plan, in this, this event, this, this moment, in the consciousness of now, uh, am I conscious of that and, and, and the impact on that? Yeah, there's, it's, a, it's a very important ingredient in building a brand. Yeah, so I'd love to go just a little bit deeper on that, sure. especially for this audience, because I think something we talked about yesterday, and I'm, I'm always, uh, or I'm more and more focused on, right, which is, when it comes to building products in the digital world, we're, we're, we're sort of transitioning into this space now where user experience, we use the word user experience, right? We're talking about user experience. Um, but what we really mean is something emotional, yeah. like an emotional experience. Connecting What's the emotional with transaction? Right. You know? um, and, and I thought that, that that topic yesterday was, was really interesting and it's generally like missing from a lot of conversations uh, 
you know, industry conversations, sure. but it's underlying all of these experiences. There's a dependency on qualifying a strong emotional transaction between you and your customer in order to drive your business. Either you're relieving the amount of time in their day, or you're, make, you're making something better, There's some value proposition that's gonna allow them to be happier, right? So even if it's sub subtractive, right, in, 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 the, in how it's being built, you're, uh, you, there is an urgency about solving for that. And it's not something you could poo-poo or get to later, or the warm and fuzzy stuff that's the nice to have, oh, we'll deal with that later, we'll make the logo prettier, or the interface, oh, the, no, no. From inception, you had better reconcile what it is that you're moving and what's that value proposition? How are you gonna guarantee that your brand, that well, that is to be overly, that overly gushing with inventory, overly fulfilling the promise, so people line up coming back because you're magically filling that well all the time. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the core of what's gonna build your brand yep. and your business. Um, great. So, moving on, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about your career arc, or let's just call it, um, you know, your ability to have, you, what, you, what you've been able to, <laughs> what you've been able to uh, achieve moving across sectors, right? Yeah. So I think today there's this sort of irresistible urge for brands and products to, to sort of move in all directions and become multi-platform and 360, um, and you see so many failures. Sure. Right? Um, it's not an easy thing to do. And you were able to move from the fashion business into the media business um, and now into the venture business. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I guess the question is sort of like, you know, what's the secret? Or is there something in, is there some... Sure, there's a connect thread through all of them. I mean, the, in the Echo and the apparel business is an emphasis on serving this kind of 14 to 40 year old guy, right? And even though we've had successful you know, entrees into women's and other categories, children's, the core has been serving and delighting or attempting to delight that elusive male consumer. In Complex, despite it being a different product and, and array of services, it's more media and pop culture, we're still working on that same guy, right? So there, I, I've had a very vertical approach in saying, you know, look, I don't know every customer in the world, but I, I know how to speak to and hopefully universally the things that kind of connect that cohort. Mm -hmm. And even my point of view on now venture and yeah. isn't to be in the venture business. I'm looking to build a brand around entrepreneurship and serve that same guy. Right? And it compel and inspire the, that same useful cohort that represents everything promising but everything scary as shit. Right? Like that's that that's who I've been able to kind of connect to in my career. And that's the one kind of, I guess, architecturally engineered, you know, uh, spine that connects these businesses for me. Right. And, you know, despite the disparity. And also, there's a fallacy to think like, oh, you know, multitasking, da, 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 da. I've got great managers and stakeholders sufficiently distributed in these businesses to create the, the illusion I guess, I would just have the luxury of, of looking like a multitasker. Um, but I've been really lucky at picking, and, and maybe a little smart, okay, smart, um, uh, at picking uh, the, the right kind of operational teams, and, and also having maybe a longer view than most people, especially venture-backed business. I mean, you have to, I didn't take any institutional money in building my business. And you know, building Echo, I was like an equity work. Like I just used banks and leverage and, uh -huh. you know, today I, I reflect back on that period of how I built the business. I, I would say I would, wouldn't necessarily prescribe that as the best path, but I don't totally disparage it. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, when you, you have to have a long view of building this stuff. Man, it's a living, breathing ecosystem. They're like, they're living creatures, right? Each one of these. And they don't, they don't just, Incubate and voila, right? Five X, seven X, ten X. Bullshit. Not every time. Yeah. And it's not bad. It's not like that. Just like we're in. This is a. This is like we're, we're affecting. We're creating e ecosystems of people being able to like send their kids to college. Mm -hmm. right? like, it's a complex thing that we're trying to do. You know what I mean? Besides just like okay, here's the good, the service, the product. 
I sell it, transact, profit. Yes, okay, those are mechanical things. That's how it works. It's one, that's one on one. But when you're really building this stuff to be sound and robust, um, it takes a minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you know, there's a lot. I see a lot in common again between like fashion and and media, right? Yeah. They're very like adjacent businesses, and especially um, Echo and Complex. Yes. Um, two sides of a coin, maybe. Um, and I know for the last two years you've been working on artists and instigators, and that's been a big learning experience for you sure. as well, right? Yeah. Certainly this through line of entrepreneurship, but being on the other side of the table, um, making investments. Um, maybe just a minute talking about sure. what that experience has been like and yeah. where you are in that. Well, you know, process. I kind of feel like, you know, I didn't know what the hell venture capitalists did until 07 when I was like restructuring businesses that had kind of all combined with kind of all bank finance businesses and when the credit crisis happened, I had the good pleasure um, and misfortune in some cases of meeting many venture capitalists. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, and, but one group I met, there were a really cool bunch of guys approached me that wasn't exactly the right fit for uh, one of the businesses that I own in terms of them capitalizing it. Uh, we hit it off and they, and, and they would tell me how broken their industry was. And they invited me to participate and become a partner in their in their, their group. Um, and I was in kind of a soul searching mode, thinking about brands, just what I do, right? Uh, so I was really compelled um, to say, you know, what I'm interested in building a new brand. You know, I'll build the brand around entrepreneurship. I'm not, I don't know if I'm interested in building a venture capital group. And once I learned the kind of mechanical things of investing in people's crazy ideas or dreams or innovations, I realized I'd kind of been doing that for, you know, 15 years prior, mm -hmm. right? Uh, um, if it was in video gaming or you know, skateboarding or, you know, or complex. Um, so I just hadn't organized it. Uh, and what I'm trying to do with artists and instigators is really figure out how, much like how we start this conversation, how do we organize the ecosystem in a commercial, consumer-facing way that where there's a less barrier to enter? And what would the benefits to culture be like for, if we did that? And could we organize a consumer product platform and a marketplace around that? Mm -hmm. And from you know what I'm working on and the research that I'm seeing and, and doing, um, I'm really, really enthusiastic about it. So really, when, I, when, I'm, when I share with people, even though it's an obtuse metaphor for many, and I'm sorry that it's obtuse that, you know, I apologize for asking to look into the future, but, um, you know, I'm trying to build like the Nike of entrepreneurship. And uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to build. So, right. So I love this. Um, and this is sort of maybe a good place to, to kind of end up in the conversation, right? Which is you, you've, you've been using this uh, in, in a conversation we've had over the last year, right? To do what Nike did for sports. That's what you want to do for entrepreneurship. Yes. And I think it kind of brings a full circle to, to the beginning of the conversation and the setup for this, which is, you know, the idea of hustle or jichinho is bringing this concept of like entrepreneurship and these sort of high polluting, um, somewhat elitist or at least industry terms Mostly down inside, right? Yeah, down to uh, the masses, right? To the mall. So when to the mall world. Yeah, yeah. That's it. So I, I love you to just. Just give a little tease sure. on what that, how you see that playing out. What is that? Well, look it's like? going to be a look. It, it's first people say, well, oh, you know, everyone likes soccer. Nike makes sense. They make shoes. You know, like that makes sense. But what they're missing is that they, when you reflect back on you know 1972 when when Nike was launching, it was when it went from being Blue Ribbon Sports to Nike, and they came up with the swoosh, and they you know Steve Prefontaine, was the first athlete, the 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 sporting goods industry was very fragmented and, and was really built in verticals, right? Like it, you, you depended at that time as an athlete on either the Olympics or, you know, a great event at the Olympics or a great event at a World Cup or a World Series, maybe you would score you the cover of a cereal box, like Cal you know, like Wheaties or something. Um, so it wasn't organized in the way that like the kind of training up off the court way uh, that, that they actually obviously built the, this massive industry around. And not just for them, but for like the number two, three, four, five players as well. Even though they are the number two, three players, because right? <laughs> they require them. But um, uh, so so it's it's a it's going to be a blend of a marketplace, media product, 
and um, pretty cool crowdsourcing, uh, uh, kind of crowd participation in brand building, right? And uh, it's, it's really exciting. So the idea is to get more people involved, right. to get more Again, people which, in, like working on the lemonade stand, right? Like an authentic way, you know, in a way where they're actually touching and feeling, being part of the movement. Yeah. Like, and and the intent here is that like. You know, I, I took 10 years, I worked in the, in the not-for-profit educational sector, I had a real bug up my ass about how broken education is, and um, I think it's a Western culture thing, I think it's a pedagogy thing, it goes back to Andrew Carnegie, rest in peace, I don't think he ever meant the Carnegie unit to, be, to do what it did to kind of like fuck up education. Um, uh, not his fault, uh, it's just, they just used his name. Um, but the, uh, the, 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 I spent a tremendous amount of hours and resources trying to, you know, teach kids that like pursue entrepreneurship in the classroom, and I and I and I, and I think there's a good and there's a place for that. And I know groups like Endeavor and Kaufman and Aspen they do they have great curriculum products that they deploy, and that's going to be a part of the movement. But that's kind of you need a lot of muscle for that because that means you're going to like fight in the classroom. Like that's a brute force combat hand-to-hand -hand thing to be able to build products that actually comply to the, the measuring standards and to, to, be, to, be, to be scaled into the classroom. My thesis is that how do we build more of a kind of outside game Tai Chi approach, mm -hmm. right? Where by Nike said just do it, right? They didn't say just cut your calories. They didn't say just don't fry it. They said just do it. Right, and that, and, and there was, and, and look, there's a lot of people that use the platform less efficiently, right? There's guys that are 300 pounds rocking Nike, like, you know, but there's disproportionately folks that at least aspire to be fit and uh, um, become a part of the belief of the values. And there's a power in building that uh, that could migrate people in a way other than maybe the brute force or the blunt force of or you know, this is how we prescribe you doing, yeah. rather than how letting them parrot, parrot greatness. I think is is uh, yeah. is is another modality to learning. Yeah, I like that idea of the, the developing like a, a shared value system yeah. around what entrepreneurship means, and also making it accessible. The other day, Super you know, and maybe we we, we uh, our, our time is is getting short, so maybe we we close on this point, but. Um, you know, I think maybe, especially for people who've been through, you know, four days of, of, uh, of an, you know, an awesome global conference, um, you know, I see a lot of, you know, as I travel the globe, I see a lot of the same people. Yeah. Um, I see a lot of different people here, which is really exciting. Yes. Um, but the idea, you know, we were talking yesterday about the, the notion that sort of like, to some degree, Sometimes it feels like it's the same people talking to you know we're talking the same talking to ourselves essentially right um, so we've had this conversation a yeah. lot for instance yeah. <laughs> um, yeah but but the idea of so thank you. of uh, pushing you know building a platform that get that opens the conversation to more people right um, is seems like what you're getting at and is also maybe like a great sort of ending point because that's uh, you know something everybody in the room could kind of take with them, right? I mean, How do we all... do it together? Right. right. Yeah. So, it's exciting. I mean, look, I think that's the need, is, is how do we use our... Uh, I see, there was an instance where I was invited in 2008, before the election, Obama versus McCain, by Bill and Melinda Gates at the launch of Get School, right? And the Get Schooled event was going to be a movement. And they did this deal with Viacom where they were going to simulcast on 10 channels an hour-long program that was going to create a movement around like Ed performing, right? And there was going to be this movie, you might have heard about it, it's called Waiting for Superman, right? Good movie, uh, uh, good movie, I liked it very much. Um, but, and I was at the end of eight years in on this educational reform journey, and I'm in this room with these guys, and, and I saw how much money and resources were being applied to tell a conversation that was still fundamentally a brute force conversation. Mm -hmm. It was an hour-long program where they're basically basically telling us the very names, get school. Right? Like it, it was flawed from inception. Mm -hmm. Intentions, great, but the road to hell paved with good intentions. Mm -hmm. Right? So that's when it occurred to me, like, I can't compete on this level because I'm I'm outmatched. 
like when I look at like the, like the amount of resources and dollars that are being employed by like a Bill and Melinda Gates, and, and Bill and Melinda Gates, and Bill's written about this. He's written about like the inefficiencies of fighting the, the fight, the education reform fight in this manner. So that was the moment of eureka for me to say maybe there's another way, you know, because you know maybe there's a way like Brand Jordan, you know, like how do you create a modality where people want to earn it? They want to They want to. They want to trade the currency of respect to you because they see that you earned what is essentially cool to them. Cool being the thing that is earned by the currency of respect. By, by way that you evidence what you did or performed. When Michael Jordan jumped at the free throw line, hung out, shorts, that shit was cool, right? When Mark Zuckerberg like does face mash and launches like a, 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 a world paradigm shifting company in Facebook, that's cool. How do we get people to parrot to those things and how do we productize that conversation? That's the opportunity. Awesome. Cheers, man. Thank you.